My name is John Radolf Silber. I was born in Berlin, Germany, June 26, 1921. I went to school in Germany, the uh, Volksschule, the first school is four years. After you make a certain examen, you go to a gymnasium. There you start, in my case, with Latin, then French, and three years later you have a choice between English and Italian. My parents, my father's name was Leo, L-E-O, and my mother's name Amalie, she was called Mali. Uh, my father was usually busy. He was in the army in the First World War, and after the war uh, he went into the tobacco manufacturing business. My mother was a housewife. I had a governess most of the time until I was about 10 years. And then I had what was called a Kinderfräulein, which means the maid who supervises my schoolwork and goes out with me in the park and so forth. And life was very regular. I did not see my parents that much, but that's not unusual in Germany at that time. The children were kept out of the regular life. You saw them at mealtimes and to say good night. I had a sister about 10 years older than I was. I had relatively little contact with her because of the age difference. I had a lot of family. Uh, none of them survives. Birthday parties and going uh, or allowed to be going to the movies after I was about 10 years old. They just had started from silent movie to sound on the track. And I was pretty busy. If I didn't study for the school, I had lessons playing the piano, which helped me eventually in life to make a living. If you had the wrong religion, let's say apart from Protestantism and Catholicism, uh, you were a separate group. You stuck together socially, also in school. Uh, my problem really started in gymnasium when I felt for the first time that there was a certain kind of anti-Semitism. And 1936, I was not allowed to go to school anymore. And I finished the school year in a separate Jewish school. So I was about 16 years old at the time. And a short time later, we had the Kristallnacht, the night of the broken glass. 1938, where at least, to the best of my knowledge, most of the men in Berlin were arrested, put for either short time in a concentration camp or were kept imprisoned. At that time, there was an offer to have small children, small children, I mean up to about 14 years, to be sent either to England, that the so-called kinder transport, or some children were offered to go to the United States and be adopted by American families. Neither one was much of interest to me or to my parents, but 1938, after the Kristallnacht, my father was arrested, and I had played with the idea without success to get a visa for another country to leave and eventually ask my parents to immigrate. Uh, nothing had come for it. I was once in a British consulate, asked for a visa for British Honduras, and all I got was my passport back with a stamp in it saying, visa solicited. I heard later this man visa refused. I didn't know that at the time. Snidey remarks by the teachers. Uh, 
also a difference in treatment by the teachers. You had to, to work twice as hard and still you didn't get a better rating than the uh, Christian. On November the 10th, I came home. I don't remember where I had been and I saw some Nazis in uniform on motorcycle driving on the sidewalk in our part of the town and with an iron bar breaking the windows of Jewish stores which had been marked Jude, painted on the outside. Uh, later on during the night I heard a lot of noise and the next morning I watched as uh, there was f uh, fire on, on the roof in one of the synagogues near our apartment and while I went to look for a possibility to leave the country trying to go to different consulates I watched how an entire synagogue was burned down and people were just standing around so were police and the fire department nobody tried to put out the fire by that time I really got a bit afraid and when I came home I told my mother that I wanted to leave any way I could to get out of the country. And her reply was children stay with their parents, which uh, during my use was <laughs> in order and an accepted fact. That's about uh, the best I can say because after that, after Kristallnacht, it was a question of being able to get out anyway you needed permission from the police department to leave the country. All you could take with you were 10 marks, which were the equivalent of about $4 officially. And if a family left and wanted to take their furniture and so with them, they had to get permission from the Gestapo who inspected everything first. And you were not allowed to have any jewelry and take those with you and uh, that's about as much I remember at this late date. Where were you when your father was arrested? Hiding near the kitchen in a room which our cook had used, but Jews were not allowed to have cooks or anybody under 65 years of age, so I just locked the door on the inside in case anybody would try to open the door. And as soon as it was dark, or about 7 o'clock or 6 o'clock, I packed a small suitcase and I told my mother I was going to try to get out of the country. I had a valid passport because I had been in Hungary and Budapest during the summer and uh, before restrictions were applied. So I could get to the uh, uh, railroad station and buy a ticket showing the passport, which was valid, and left on a train south, which went through Austria to Italy. The train stopped at Genoa, that was the last station. I went out there, and with the help of a taxi chauffeur, I was told where I could find a philatelic stamp dealer and I took a small package that I had with stamps to them to sell because all I had was about the three dollar equivalent in liras now and I needed some money to take a cab to make a phone call to my mother to tell her where I was and we made an arrangement I had found out that there were several ships which were leaving the next day that she would go to the steamship company and see if she could buy a passage and pay for it in Berlin. And that uh, she succeeded doing that and I went on a steamer by the name of Cristobal Colon, or Columbus in Italian. I had no idea where it went to, all I knew was South America. From, I went on that ship and uh, the first stop was in Marseille, France after that in Spain, Barcelona, then it went towards the Atlantic and the first stop was La Guaira, Venezuela. From La Guaira it went through the Panama Canal to Ecuador, Guayaquil.
from Guayaquil to Buenaventura, which is in Colombia, from there to, Le to Peru, where they finally let us leave the ship under military escort. The port was Moyendo. And from there, we went via Lima in train to the border with Bolivia, which was the Lake Titicaca. Crossing the lake the next day with the railroad to Bolivia, for which we had a transit visa, which was issued on arrival in Peru. I had correspondence from my mother later when I was in Bolivia. It was 1939, the beginning of 1939. But she was deported in uh, 1942. And as I found out later, she was sent to a concentration camp in Latvia. My sister, who was 10 years older than I, did forced labor at Siemens in Berlin and was deported with her husband in one of the last trains leaving with the Jewish people in 1944. She was sent to Auschwitz and according to reports I had from the International Red Cross in Geneva, was killed at the end of 1944, but uh, the fact is unknown how she died. Once on the train, the only control is train control. As I said, Austria had been annexed by Hitler, so there was no more control there. And crossing the Italian border, they looked at me as a kid and did not bother me. The, with the little money I had in Italy, all I could pay for was the taxi to take me to the uh, philatelic stamp dealer. And later on, what was, I was left with the equivalent of about two dollars on board. Uh, the two dollars were used by me to buy cigarettes later on. As somebody explained to me, I could sell those cigarettes at a higher price. In ports, w once we left the ship, I did that eventually until the guy who worked the sale of cigarettes at the bar on the ship got wise to it and said, no more sale of cigarettes before we hit any port. So that ended for me about in Panama, where I later found out cigarettes were even cheaper because there was no tax. It was the American Panama concession, the Panama Canal. Then when I went, eventually, when I ended up in Bolivia, I met a friend who was there with his parents, and uh, he put me in touch with the joint committee, which we called Hilfsverein, who told me that the visa which I had was good for 30 days, and the government did not want anybody with no legal visa in their country, and the only possibility for me to stay would be to go in the jungle to colonize. Well, I had no idea what that was all about and said, sure. So they bought me a shirt, a khaki shirt, a pair of Jodport riding pen, a pair of boots, high boots, and a big straw hat and told me they would take me down by plane. Their plane was a converted DC-3 with no seats. A group of about 12 people sat on the side. And when we landed and stumbled out of the airplane, I was told, all right, from now on you travel by mule. There was another day and a half. You slept on the ground in the meantime. And when we got there, we were assigned to some people, which in my opinion were criminals who had fled Europe, Italians mainly. And uh, they said, okay, from tomorrow on we'll teach you, you work with us. The work consisted mainly of uh, destroying whatever grew, and everything grew. You could take a piece of wood, 
struck it in the earth and there would be leaves a few days later. So we started whacking away on trees with machetes that we got there. And uh, about three, four weeks later, I suddenly started falling down. They took me and I had a fever. There were no doctors around there. They were about a day and a half away by a mule back. What I actually had gotten was a hepatitis attack. So they treated me with local, I uh, local, with what the Indian used there. After several weeks later, they just sent me with food out to the other worker. I was not strong enough to work <laughs> with my machete again. Uh, I stayed there about a year and a half and then I really had enough because the food consisted mainly of rice, dried meat, charqui, and oranges and bananas, nothing else. So I told them I had a terrible toothache and I had to go back to the next town to see a dentist. The next town would have been Cochabamba. That took me again a day and a half on muleback with a caravan and then by truck over the Andes Mountains and then by train into Cochabamba. There I told the Hilfsfine that I would not return. Whereas, and I'm not quite sure you want that present, the local, the, the local director of that office had two employees, passed on the information by mail to Berlin that I was trying to destroy that colonization there. And I got a letter from my mother about two weeks later asking me what the heck was I doing <laughs> to, to destroy what they had, which was for the good of the refugees. Well, we straightened that one out. I never went back down there and they tried to colonize with this 12 people did not succeed. They all came back to Cochabamba about a year later. Now, shall I continue from there? Yes. In Cochabamba, you had to look for work. You had to live somewhere. The health sign said, no more help from us. So I worked first teaching Indians how to clean railroad cars. I had no idea how to do it, but I could read it, so I knew what the Kent said what to do. Then when that was over after a few weeks, I was picked up by truck to lay railroad ties. This was a very good business for some local people because the railroad ties that we put down during the day for a railroad which was to go to the then very small town Santa Cruz on the border with Brazil. Now it's a very important town which wants to separate from Bolivia. Anyhow, and after laying railroad ties, I worked with a painter. He showed me how to paint. Then I worked as a waiter in a restaurant. They showed me how to <laughs> serve food. After that, I worked as, um, I'm trying to get the right name for it. Uh, they call it in Bolivia a muchacho, which usually the little kids who carry packages for you or so that women don't carry packages if they buy something. Unfortunately, the owner of the place was a German captain. They had um, a branch of the Lufthansa, which was called Condor, and the wife and the sister of his had some like a little uh, resort. They took in guests in two or three rooms to sleep there. And during the day, they offered food for lunch and dinner. And I worked there as uh, a maid to do everything, cleaning, dusting. The one thing which bothered me most was I broke a little tiny cup in which they served uh, espresso and they made me pay for it. I had to spend about half a month's salary. 
there were plenty of those little cups around because some of the immigrants bought their glassware and their dinnerware and they had a lot of the stuff and sold it for very little money because they couldn't use it. I worked there about a half a year and then I figured my parents or my mother in this case had visa to come to Uruguay where we had relatives and the next news was on the ship that she had passage for the ship she was not allowed to leave Germany the Nazis has passed a law nobody under 65 years was allowed to leave and she wasn't 65 yet so now she wrote I should try anyway if I couldn't get her into Bolivia even and I couldn't I had no means and I had no connections so I only heard from her in more or less covered language what was going on the bombardment every night uh, in the meantime British and American airplanes bombed most of uh, Berlin and um, in 1942, through somebody else who had left Germany, I got a short letter telling that my mother had been removed from Berlin. I didn't know where to. I found this out years later through the Red Cross. Now, I, in the meantime, then moved to another city. The so-called immigrants or refugees helped each other. Uh, anybody who had a furnished room somewhere would allow you to sleep on the floor in this room and give you a, a yama uh, cover to cover yourself. And I went to, to different cities trying to find something to do with the little bit of knowledge that I had for regular work. And I ended uh, then in Tarija, which is near the Argentine border, uh, there was a refugee who had a cleaning establishment which meant uh, he gave some Indian women in the morning whatever they brought in for cleaning she took it to the river and beat the heck out of it and brought it back the next day and then he ironed it the ironing consisted of a coal iron with a fire in it so he told me in two days how to do it and then sold me his establishment which was an open, uh, two open doors with an open room and his equipment was this iron, coal iron for the equivalent of something like five dollars, I didn't have more, and told me how to do it. So I bought that and the first thing I did was I burned two pairs of pants because little pieces of the burning coal fell out of the iron. <laughs> As I couldn't pay the man everything, what he wanted, new pens, I made an arrangement with him that I would iron everything for him without payment. That was my first experience. I stayed in that for about five months. At night, you usually played diets with locals, there was nothing else to do there. No electricity most of the time. And uh, by chance, one day a stranger came and told us he was an Argentine congressman and he was on the other side of the river, which was Argentina. And uh, if he could do anything for us, for us meant me, there was no other refugee there. And I told him, yes, I was trying to get out of Bolivia. I had no passport, I had no papers. And he said, well, for about $30, he would arrange it that I could leave Bolivia and he would personally take me to Argentina. I didn't have the $30, so what was the next big thing to do? There was no work for me. I worked there as a waiter for a few weeks, but that doesn't bring in very much money. So we played dice at night and cards and it took about a week and a half before I had the equivalent of thirty dollars made it, I paid him, he told me look you be at that and that place at four in the morning no luggage, nothing so I got there and he was there with his car, a private car and he said well you have to ride in the back he offered the trunk and said in here 
and gave me a piece of wood and said, you stick this so it won't close. And then we went up the mountain, down the mountain. I always figured they broke all my bones in my body. But we got to the next town after about, oh, it must have been eight, nine hours. He said, sit here. He took me to his house, what I assume was his house, and put me in a room. There was a lady there who offered me something to eat. And he said, I come back in half an hour, just stay here. Don't go out, don't speak to anybody. Well, I did this. So the lady came in and told me, well, you do a very, very good thing. This is a good business, and you will make money. I had no idea what she was talking about. Eventually, he came back, and I told him about it. What did she want from me? When he started to laugh. This house apparently was the local bordello, and she thought that I was a buyer. He apparently tried to sell it. <laughs> he took me to the railroad space station with the ticket that he paid for money that I'd given him, and said, it is now a day and a half on the railroad to Buenos Aires. When the control comes, you say, oh, oh, that you have pain in your face and you cannot speak. They don't uh, control things too much. I did that a few times, slept in between, in the seat, sitting there. When I got to Buenos Aires, I had almost a few coins left. I had an address of my sister's in-laws, mother-in-law. I wanted to go to that address of what the a number 6,000 something in the Calle Avenida Cordova in Buenos Aires. I had no idea how near this was from the railroad station. Well, I walked for about two and a half hours till I got to that number. When you are at that age, 17, 18 years old, that's an adventure for you. Really, you don't know in how much danger you are. I found out about a year later, when I was already in Uruguay, that I had malaria and I got several attacks. And all I had received in the jungle was quinine against malaria, which doesn't help. There are three different stages, primera, segunda, tercera. I had no idea which one I had when I got to Buenos Aires. I, I walked about two hours and a half till I got to that house number. And I rang the bell, and the woman opened the door, and you said, you had, remember me? I am your son's brother-in-law. Okay. She said, what can I do for you? I said, can I live here for a few days till I find my way? I knew nothing about Buenos Aires. And she said, well, you can sleep on the couch in the living room, but I have to tell you, we have friends here, and we play cards every night, so you cannot sleep before we finish the game. What I didn't know was the timetable is a little different. In Argentina, people have dinner around 10 o'clock at night, so when they play cards after that, it is 12 or 1. So I sat there, and my eyes closed, and I fell asleep every night until they finished their game, and in the morning I started walking towards downtown to look if I find something to do. I found a store where it says, Man spricht Deutsch, speak English, and I went in there, and it was an immigrant, a German immigrant. He says, all right, I know you're illegally here, you told me, but you can work in the basement, we have a lot of uh, fantasy jewelry that we want to get rid of. They have to be counted and packed and so on. You can do that. Well, I did that for about uh, three weeks. And I slept still there from midnight till morning at the in-laws place. And one of the buyers of that fantasy jewelry came one day and she said, you know, I am from Europe too. He didn't say where. I have a nice apartment. I'm legal here. If you want to, you can move in with me. 
I will not charge you anything, but you have to help me certain things. I said, what do you mean I help you? Well, he said, don't count so exactly when you prepare an order of front of me that I have given upstairs. So I counted instead of 144, 144 a gross, I counted 150 in that gross and so on. Well, he liked that. And after a few days, he said, please move in with me. Naturally, I wanted to get out of that situation I was in, and I moved with him. Uh, one day he said, look, do me a favor, I have a package here with a black nylon stocking, which were very, very rare in Argentina at that time. That was during the war, 1942, 41, 42. And uh, you take him to this apartment and you collect that and that amount of money. I don't remember how much, which I did. But when I rang the bell there and the lady came and I said, I bring this from Don and Thor and you're supposed to give me so many pesos. Well, she said, uh, can't we make some kind of arrangement there? I said, what kind? Well, you don't know? I said, no, I was pretty innocent still in this thing. Well, when I came back and I told him this, this guy laughed too. He said, you know, she comes and visits me once a month, and she wanted to trade a little, not pay the full amount of cash. Well, anyhow, I saw her later again. She really came. She was an old acquaintance of hers. Then, after about half a year in Argentina, a policeman was sent by my relatives from Montevideo, Uruguay, to try to help me cross over from Argentina to Uruguay. And he had, as a policeman, the necessary uh, connections, which he did. We landed in a small town in Uruguay, Colonia. From there, you take a bus about four hours to Montevideo. And at the bus station, he said, OK, here you are. The next corner is the address where you want to go to your relatives. I went there. They expected me. He must have telephoned before we left Colonia. And they told me, yeah, you can sleep with my cousin, which was then 10 years old, uh, for which I was very grateful. And my uncle gave me some little change, which was the equivalent of maybe five dollars or so, because to take a streetcar bus, you have to have money. And he said, tomorrow morning I'll give you an address. You go there and see if they can recommend you for some kind of work. Well, the next morning I got on the streetcar, and uh, when I put the hand in my pocket, to take out the change I had, there was no money in there. I wasn't anywhere. So who could have had it? My 10-year-old cousin. Uh, I didn't say anything because you can't accuse anybody. The second night, I stayed awake, but I did as if I was asleep. And after he shut off the light, and thought I was asleep, he got out of bed, went where my jacket was and stuck his hand in pocket. And I jumped out of bed, I said, okay now, what are you doing with the money? Your parents give you money. Well, he said, I buy chocolatinas, which are little pieces of chocolate. I said, you can't eat all this chocolate. He said, no, sometimes I throw this chocolate away. I collect the pictures which are in there. I never told his parents about it. Unfortunately, years later, uh, he had a bit of a kleptomanie. A stamp dealer called me in Montevideo and told me, look, something disappeared while your cousin was in here. If he brings it back tomorrow, we'll forget about it. If he doesn't bring it back, I will call you and tell you that I went to the police. So I went to their house and I talked to him. 
I still didn't want to get my end involved into this. And apparently he took it back the next day. From then on, I was very careful when he came and visited me later after I, <laughs> I married. In the meantime, we were jumping right now. This was around 1942. Uh, I had a girlfriend. Uh, I had a job at somebody who would employ illegals, like we do here in Atlanta. But uh, at night, I played piano in a private club, sometimes in a cafe. And uh, I was very serious with this girl, and she with me. We wanted to get married eventually. But I had a little misunderstanding with her father, and the thing was broken off. There was another girl which I never paid attention to who had watched me apparently and she entered the picture and after three months uh, we got a serious understanding. She was then uh, about 16, 17 and I talked to her parents and they say no she can't get married before she's 18 at least. And I didn't know that a man cannot marry in Uruguay if he is not at least 23 years old. He needs permission from his parents. I had no parents to give permission, though my grandmother who lived in Montevideo in the meantime had to give permission, and she didn't want to give permission for me. He said, you're crazy, getting married? What? You have no money, you have no job, you have no education. I said, look, that I discussed uh, with my bride, not with you. So anyhow, we got married. I got some of the best gifts that you can get when you get married. Somebody gave me an uh, equivalent of about $20 and said, buy yourself a new mattress when you buy a bed. Another gave me a set of a cheese knife and butter knife which they had used possibly for 50 years before. It looked. <laughs> and so forth and so forth. I learned there's an old saying, you should have family, but you shouldn't know them. And there I learned this thing. I never thought about it, but uh, one thing after another, while I was in Argentina, once I got a package from an aunt who was uh, well, financially well suited in Uruguay. What was in that package? Five razor blades, a pair of long woolen underpants from my uncle, and a piece of chocolate. That's everything I needed in my life. So you learn about family. In Montevideo, by pure chance, I worked day and night in two different jobs. Uh, friend of my girlfriend said, you know, I know a Frenchman who used to buy a wool for a big factory in France, but now with the war on, they don't have any more business. And he retired, but his son wants to start something. You know English well? Naturally. Can you code and decode cables? Absolutely. I didn't know what he was talking about. <laughs> So I went and this man asked me the same question. I told him my story and about knowledge, yes, because my friend had told me he doesn't know what he's talking about either. So anything I want to know, you call me on the phone and tell you how to do it. So he hired me for half day work, so I gave up one of the two other jobs for half day. And after a few months, we started working with the United States and the man on the other end was also a German Jew, though very often on normal distance telephone calls, we spoke in German, in German, which was not a good idea during the war because those calls were listened in, but it was strictly business. And after about a year, I bought myself Uruguayan documents. If you know the right people, they do help you to the right person and the right department of the police department and I got what they called cedula, 
which is like an ID card. And um, about two years later, I got married. I was then 23 and a half, and uh, my wife was 18. She worked, she learned dressmaking, and I was working two jobs, and eventually I took on another profession, buying stamps from people, I don't know where they got them from, in huge quantity. Put them in a bathtub, washed the paper off, sorted them, and resold them to stamp stores in Montevideo. An unusual occupation, for sure, but it keeps you busy. Uruguay was a very peaceful, neutral country, and during the summer it's beautiful. Beaches all around Montevideo, so you can go swim, lie on the beach. It was relatively cheap then. When I had uh, my job to eat, I used to walk from our warehouse very often to the end station of a streetcar in a one hour lunchtime and bought a, bath, a glass of soda water and a piece of meat, which is the color of that was gray. I never knew what animal that came from, but it was cheap. <laughs> and uh, eventually, our business with the United States started to really get going. That was in '42. I took on two employees for this wool business. And my boss said, look, if you really want to learn what you, we are talking and doing now, you come in 7 o'clock if you want to every morning, and I make arrangement with the foreman in the sorting plant to teach you the technical aspect of the business, which I did. I still had no money. I lived in furnished rooms in two or three different ones. I ate when I come home at night dry rolls, bread, and a bottle of milk, which I put outside the window during the night so it wouldn't get sour. Uh, I'm th still eating a lot of rolls today. I like them. <laughs> I don't like the milk anymore. <laughs> but uh, as I said, we got married eventually. She worked, and I worked, and we bought some used furniture. I rented one room and the two and a half rooms that I had to a young dentist who didn't have enough money, who couldn't have his own place. You manage. But after 45, when the war was over, my boss, as a Frenchman, took over the Croix Rouge Francaise to send from French people gifts to France clothing, shoes, whatever. Eventually other countries did the same. The Czechs did the same, British did the same, and I got a lot of contact with other consulates. And I was in charge of taking care of all the shipments. We did it for the Russians. When shipments were prepared for Russians, big cases, and a Russian boat came in, I had to go to the port now, for the port by now, you needed special permits. Don't forget, it was still short time after the war, and Russians especially are very careful. So you get to the ship, the captain comes out, greets you, one glass of vodka and the second glass of vodka standing up on the rail before he let you on the ship. And then all you had to do was supervise that they take the right carton and unload them, and away you go. But one day, at the American consulate, a vice consul made me aware of the both, which I told you before, a law, it's not a law, uh, I don't know what it is. A, a permit under Truman was published that if you were under 21 years of age and your parents and family had been killed, you could apply for entry in the United States. And there were 5,000 of those visas out. And he said, you qualify for that, but you have to have some kind of documents, who you are, where you come from, and so on. I had nothing but that Uruguayan paper now. 
So I borrowed some money and he helped me get a re-enter permit into Uruguay because I had no, no permanent residence there. I had that ID, that was it. So he helped me to get the permit to re-enter. I borrowed the money from my relatives and I flew to Germany. But first I had to go to Holland, to Den Haag, to get permission from the Allied authorities headquarters were in Den Haag, Holland. I had to go there. They gave me permission to enter Bremen, Hamburg, and Germany, and Berlin. It was very destroyed to my pleasure, but you feel every person you talk to. What did he do two years ago? A very bad feeling, believe me. I, I didn't feel happy about it, but I got the documents I needed. I got copies of my birth certificate, of my first school entry. Uh, I got the, oh, and from the police department that I had never been arrested. Flew back to Montevideo, gave this to the consulate. The vice consul told me, I'll take care of it, I'll help you. But you need an affidavit from somebody that you don't become a burden to the government. I exchanged stamps with a pastor in Oregon and wrote him about what I was doing now. And he said, I will send you an affidavit. He sent me an affidavit and when the consul saw us, he laughed. He says, how does he live? Doesn't he eat? He had six children, a wife, and according to the affidavit, we saw what his salary was. He said, no good, you need somebody who can give an affidavit, a real one. About two weeks later, I got a letter from the pastor. He says, look, I traveled by railroad to San Francisco, and I told your story to somebody I spoke with, and he said, I'm Jewish too. I can give you affidavit. I have already given many for my family, but I have a nephew. I will mention it to him. Uh, about a month later, I got an affidavit from somebody I didn't know. All the paper carefully prepared. Men was a very, very rich man, I <laughs> saw from the paperwork. And now my said, give me the paperwork. Within a month, you will know. About two weeks later, he said, you have to rush. It expires. Well, there was a one-year term for this setup. So I told my boss about it. He said, good luck. Maybe we can work together when you're in the States, which actually I did later on. And we sold the furniture that I had, packed our suitcases, and I got through connection that I had with the steamship company, a cabin on a freighter which took six weeks for Montevideo to get to the United States because it stopped in every port for freight. But I got that within 30 days because you couldn't get a passenger aboard. They came once a month and so on. That's how I entered the United States, except that the agent that I told you I spoke German to on the phone uh, waited at the ship and said, I got a hotel room for you in New York. I was going to Philadelphia, and uh, here is the bill. The bill was something like $47, and what an amount I hadn't seen in a long time privately for how many nights per night. So I stayed there three days, made a few phone calls, and went to Philadelphia. That did not work out with the wool firm. So I went every day from Philadelphia, there was winter time now, December, snow, ice, from Philadelphia to New York by train and at night back to Philadelphia, looking for a job. Some people I had done business with as an employee in Montevideo, when I told them I'm now here, if they can use me, do we need more competition for the answer? <laughs> Uh, I figured uh, I have to look out for myself, and I put an ad in the New York Times. 
wool expert looking for financial assistance. And somebody answered the ad. And I had a meeting and he said, I have several businesses here. I will finance you. You can use my employees and let's get started. I said, what do I get out of it? Well, we'll see after a few months. In the meantime, you have a drawing of $75 a week. It was okay in 1947, 48, no. Uh, I got a very small apartment in New York at the border of Harlem and Riverside Drive on the Rio Hudson, River Hudson. My wife found a job immediately. That's where I bought my first car to move around in the United States on monthly payment with a small down payment. I had learned how to drive in Montevideo without a license. I drove my boss's car very often. From there I started working now, it takes a little time. And the man who financed me came to me and said, look, uh, one guy who had this company for export of goods to Central South America, you speak Spanish, you know people, why don't you take his business over? I said, what time do I have? Well, you have to work a little longer and weekends. I took this over, got it started. I had a secretary, a Cuban refugee. I took a second one in, which was Spanish, and he came to me with another company I had taken it over. By now we had an arrangement. One third of the profit are mine, two third are his. After three months I got the first statement. There was a minor sign. I said, what's going on? Well, he said, you have expenses we didn't figure on. You have to pay a part of my messenger, a part of the accounting, a part of the switchboard. Uh, all those things I had never thought about. I wanted to work by myself. I said, well, it takes two to tango. You learn that. And I said, well, I have to work for myself somehow. And then I explained to him, I have to go to Central and South America to speak to all the people that came from those two companies he turned over to me. And for my connection in South America, I have to get more connection. Not enough right now. Okay. He pays for the ticket and the hotels. And I went. I learned a lot on that trip from the setup. I went to Guatemala, El Salvador, Nicaragua. Honduras, Panama, Ecuador, Colombia, Peru, Bolivia. Stop there. Argentina, Uruguay is wool country. And he, this man, invited my wife in the evening to have dinner and to go out with him. Why? He wanted to know what I was doing. He couldn't figure out why I need that many hotels and travel to so many countries. So I sent him a telegram and said, look, I have excellent connections set up, but as I'm already here, I'm going to Europe from here now. But now he really got suspicious. And I flew to Spain, Portugal, Italy. Uh, where was I? Oh, Bremen. I, I couldn't go to Berlin again. There was no, no wool business. Belgium and back. I was away almost four months. And he sniffed something wasn't right. So I came back and said, look, we have to have an understanding. Either you take one third and I take two thirds if you do that kind of accounting, or I move out. We didn't have a written contract except for the first three months. Well, he said, who do you think you are? One of the people I talked to that told me, I have an uncle in New York. He would be interested to get in the wool business. 
he inherited a wool waste business from his father. They came from Russia originally. Why don't you talk to him? Maybe he would be interested. He can finance you. I did and he did. And we set up a new company. He gets two thirds. He put in one of his sons as a partner, himself as a partner, and me as a partner. But no monkey business. I told him why I do that. And I worked with him till 1954, when Sherman was born. And that time, he and his business went busted. That was the end of the Korean War and the entire fiber business went down the drain. And I said, well, I had different businesses set up in Europe. I'll take my daughter, who was born now three months old, as soon as the doctor allows, I take her down so she meets her grandparents, or the grandparents meet her. And I stay down and I can do the business. I had an office with employees. So we went down by boat. She loved it. There are some photos of that in there uh, on the boat. And I had rented, uh, with a guarantee of one of my bankers down there, I had rented a beautiful apartment on the beach. All the news that you got usually was from survivors who heard from other people that they knew uh, third-hand rumors. All I knew was that they were all not alive and not in Berlin. They couldn't import what they wanted to import, and they couldn't export with great difficulty apart from wool and so on. They were pretty neutral, but pro-American. because. They, I very often had to see one of the ministers, his name was Guani. They called him the old pig. He, old, he must have been in the 60s. He went after girls between 16 and 18. <laughs> and very often I had to go to his house to get signatures if there was an urgency for something. Uh, though I knew a lot of people in the government, but you could never ask them because you didn't know if they turn around you could be arrested and shipped out. Now you could ship to be back to Germany. War was over. When the first Jews, refugees or immigrants, call them immigrant because they needed a money guarantee of $5,000 in the Uruguayan bank before they even started talking for a reason. When the first German Jews came, that was about 1935. There was a large group of Russian, Polish, Turkish, and I don't know if there were Lebanese, could be Lebanese Jews there, completely separated. They wouldn't talk to each other, they wouldn't intermarry. The Sephardic Jews, until today, they want nothing to do with Ashkenazi. They look down on them. I have this joking right now very often. They said, what, you're German with the name the Silver? I said, have you ever heard of 1492? No, what's that? I mean, here nobody knows what that is. They don't learn it in school. They have to give an explanation of Isabella la Catolica and things, Ferdinand, and so on. But very often this question, Silver, is that a Jewish name? I said, no, I'll tell you something. You go to Jamaica and go to Curaçao, and when you say your name is Silver, they ask you, are you a Judeo? Are you Jewish? I said, why? What's going on? The first Jews in the Karim were Da Silver and Dis Silver and Silver. Therefore, there must be lots of them around. And the non-Jews, now when they hear the name Silver, it's just as a father, or some grandchildren, or grand-grandchildren of the Fardic Jews. Uh, so they were the Fardic and the Ashkenazi, 35 on German came. They are kept completely separate from the Polish, from the Hungarian. Each one was like the United Nations. They didn't want to talk to each other. Uh, German Jews were there after the war, before anybody left this country again. 
it was called, I don't know if you know, Uruguay was called the American Switzerland because hard currency, gold standard, and they stayed very no neutral. And you could get whatever you wanted, was smuggled in. Little planes, they dropped it over certain farms, from there it was brought to the city. Um, about 30,000 Jews were there at the end of the war. Afterwards, many of them left to different countries. I have some figures of the, but if I give it to you, it's too long to study that and to read that. Wool was used in huge quantity, uniforms and blankets. I mean, that's the, the, the big amounts. Small amounts, wool here for civilian clothes. There were lots and lots of mills who unfortunately were too dumb to buy new machinery later on. The Italian, the Japanese, everybody had the latest machines, produced the same type of cloth at 50% less than anybody could do it here. That's why the textile industry in this country went down the drain. This stems apart from the one which I really collected. I would, and I had many friends who collected stems. But stems that I went around buying up in stamp stores were American three cent stamps. That were the point at the time. For me, they were devices. I couldn't buy dollars, it was prohibited, but you could buy the stamps. So I usually bought the stamps at five, six times their face value, but it didn't make any difference if there were a tooth missing on the stamp. And all. I didn't care. For me, this was foreign currency. So you could sell it in any country in the world because it ended up eventually somebody sent it back to the United States for postage. So I had to buy something like 13, 14 dollars worth of stamps, American stamps. Yeah. The Germans nobody wanted because even the Nazis didn't want them. They printed such huge quantities that they possibly distributed them by the page through consulates to the dealers for free because there was a swastika on it or Hitler's head and all. I have one survivor in the family, the brother of my father, married, third marriage. He had two wives. One he divorced, one died, the third one. She was the daughter of missionaries born in China. Her husband was a diplomat and died. He was a good-looking man, that uncle. I can, we'll show you a photo of you. On the, she married him, there was a love match. She used his dead brother's paper for him. He was supposedly her brother. They were bummed out of three different apartments. She always got other apartments because of her connection from her husband and from her brother. A nice woman. I visited her when I went to Berlin in '46. Now, my uncle was unfortunately blind. He could see light, but you had to guide him. I didn't know. She didn't tell me. I bought tickets for a movie and took him to a movie, and she had to explain to him what happened. That's when I found out he was blind. Before, he was so used to that, and she uh, maneuvered him by uh, on the elbow or something. I didn't pay attention to it. Well, he died a short time later. He had three children. Two of them married German, Christian. One was in the Air Force. One woman died. I really don't know on what. But the one who was in the Air Force, they had two children. Those were his grandchildren, the uncle's grandchildren. She sent him a letter after the war, not to call her anymore. She wanted nothing to do with a Juden puck. I have that letter, he gave that to me. I should keep that. She didn't want to be known that her relatives are Jews. The woman died uh, in 19... I visited her twice after that. 
she died in the six, early 60s. When I went the first time after the war, anybody you talk to, I mean, not willingly thinking about it, it came automatically, even this one who did this or did that, automatically you figured everybody could be one, one of the murderers and so on. And that lasted, relatively speaking, quite some time. It didn't stop, it got better. But I have been in Germany in, since then, maybe 30 times. It is still, when I see, especially when I'm in Austria, and I see an old Austrian, they were worse than the German Nazis were yet. But then you figure Holland, Belgium, up the Baltic coast, everyone, they were all anti-Semites, pro-Nazis. And even the ones who were not, they were not now after the war. I still have discussion. I visit some non-Jews that I met in Murnau, you, didn't, you don't know that name. That was a town, small town near Berchtesgaden, where Hitler had his thing. Uh, Murnau, a lot of the high Nazis had villas there, they went there. I met them there years ago. They were very, very nice people. I visit them, we talk on the telephone every few weeks. Um, a year ago, no, two years ago, Lati bought not to do with the oxygen. He asked me, do me a favor take me to a synagogue, I've never been in one, and explain to me what everything is. For me it was a very odd request, but then I was thinking back, uh, look, why not? He was never in a synagogue. I took him in Berlin. There is the so-called main synagogue, was completely bummed out and burned out. But they rebuilt part of it, and the front of that is now a show piece. When you go in, they check you out like you go to the airport. No metal in your pocket, nothing. So I took them there. There is like a little museum with a lot of old photographs and so on, and explained each one to him. He was very happy about this. They knew very little about it. He is, he should have known. He, uh, no, when he went to school, naturally he didn't learn it. But after the war, he is now 72. I just talked to him two days ago again. Because as I'm going to leave next month, no, over next month, June, I wanted to know if they're there. It happened to me, uh, well, you learn that not to expect somebody to be there when you come. Bolivia, I hated it. I wish my worst enemy should live there, especially in the jungle. I went later on, twice there, with my wife to show her. She didn't want to get out of La Paz and wanted to get out of La Paz. The second day, I had to change the air ticket because the terrible headache she gets. You have to drink coca tea. She doesn't smoke, so I couldn't even inquire if there was any around. I figured I repay my debt to the United States government by doing work that they don't have to pay for. Furthermore, I had knowledge that they didn't have how somebody who comes Ill illegally or goes illegally or has false papers, a false document, I know how they think, especially the Latins. But I had all the Russian experiences. I could help some of them after hours on weekends. I had calls up to about two years ago, yet people who knew me, when something happened to them, if I can help them, this and that and so on. And I did, because some people you learn to like, some you learn to dislike thoroughly. But I even had some Arabs that I liked, nice people. I have said from the day on I came to this country, times have changed. You need identification. If it is a, like a cedula like they had with a photo fingerprint on it, 
you need you cannot have somebody going bankrupt here going to another city take another name have no documents and gets away with it i had too many cases like that here experience that was one reason the second reason was to help some people who really needed help. The third reason is you will have an ID here. It's a question of time. You definitely will because any country has it now. If it is Switzerland or if it's England or if it's Hong Kong, they have ideas. You have to know who somebody is, not in order to arrest them, but though that if something happened, they know whom to contact. They know if he has been arrested before in a minute. That's one reason, ideas. Number two, things, unfortunately, in my opinion, will change here. I don't want to put a time limit on, but the way I see it, the way I look at it, it might be slightly different. You will get in this country either a right-wing government or a left-wing government one of the two. The word democracy doesn't mean anything anymore. And the way the government is being run right now, I jokingly call it the rise and fall of the Roman Empire number two. Stay out of occupation of other countries. In some countries, yes, I can understand it, but the way it's being done right now. Look, I have had contact with some polit politician here, and you wouldn't want the experience I had with them. We had a very good director of immigration. I said, we, that I still am in it. I do visit them every few months yet, because sometimes they ask me certain cases that I have handled, if I remember that or not. We had a very, very good director of immigration here. My name is Fisher. One day he said he would not take the orders that come from Washington about how to handle certain things. And they said either you do it our way the way we want it done or you quit. Well, he was out of a job within 48 hours. After that, it's being handled in a way you you just you couldn't do it it is still very badly done right now they distributed immigration documentation all over the country they lose cases with folders they don't know in which warehouse cases with other folders are and their answer is well you have to applicate again you have to buy new money orders again, and right now it's very expensive. A petition for somebody is now $2,000. Used to be $30. There's a separation, I noticed it while talking to the different people. There's a, a separation, I don't say of race, but even of nationality. The Mexican don't want anything to do with the ones from Guatemala. You know, the illegals from Guatemala come all come via Mexico. They're being robbed there, and if they find that Guatemaltecos are here under different laws, there were a lot of laws where they could stay and work here. Uh, there was the earthquake in Salvador, Guatemala. They are still here under that law. It's now 20 years almost. They get every year a new card work permit. They hate each other. Though it's not only color of skin, the local African American don't want anything to do with the African black that come. The African black don't want anything to do with the American. You should hear them, how they talk about each other. <laughs> And to each other, um, they hate their guts. It reminds me back at the differential of the Jews from different countries. Though I have a lot of thoughts, my wife even didn't want to listen to this anymore. It is not a question of religion that separates people. 
It's a question of culture. It doesn't make any difference. Islam here, Islam there, it's the same religion. But they, have, they kill each other off. Take the Shiites and the Sunnis. Why? Because one sons-in-law and the other one is a direct uh, descender of Muhammad. Take uh, among the Jews here the same. Children of refugees or immigrants very often do not consider their parents 100% equal. You had the same if somebody uh, immigrated even before the wars from one country to another. I have heard that in Italy too. And that's one thing. There is a separation of thought that anything that happens now, science advances so fast that the parents or grandparents in some cases don't even want to hear about it. I'm one of them, I may be culpable of it. I don't want a computer, but I give you a different reason. I have watched them because we had computers and immigration. If I had a computer, I would be sitting all day long in front of the computer, being busy, either uh, talking to people or researching things or so on. Uh, there aren't that many years left for anybody to waste it like that. I got my malaria cured when I came to the United States because then it was not a question of quinine anymore. Then we had the drugs. But the drugs went only to the troops in the Pacific during my years in the jungle. You couldn't get them. I have a friend who died of yellow fever there in the jungle. It's a question of luck. It's sometimes like lottery. If you put a piece of paper out and it's a winner, your luck. Sharon, second first name Terry, last name Silver, born March 9th. <laughs> Shall I give the year? Or sure. it's no, that's not a secret. 1954. <laughs> In New York, Sinai Hospital. I saw her minutes after she was born. And what did you they say? They, I will come to that. They <laughs> took her. They took her out of that delivery home, and I saw her. A nurse had her carrying in somewhere, and she looked wet, red like a really born monkey at that moment. And I told her that. <laughs> I went down to my car in Central Park West where I had parked it, and I had put a sign on. My wife is giving birth, though I wouldn't get a green ticket for $20. The cop must have come by and he wrote on it, congratulations. <laughs> I didn't have a ticket. Same piece of paper was still under the windshield wiper. <laughs>